Um, well, we're going to have to get started, though, otherwise we'll all be really late for class. So go ahead and we'll work on communications. All right. Yeah, I'm Mario Cardinale, one of the third year residents, and um, I'm doing my talk today at fetal boards on fetal echogenic bowel. Um, so thinking last night, I wanted to kind of make an opening story, and you know, I really couldn't think of a good one, and I'm, but I'm going to still tell this story. And it probably won't make sense, but uh, hopefully you'll understand the point when I'm done with it. Um, so I was in Conway for the past two months, um, and I saw this patient. This patient came in. She was a new OB patient. We've never seen her before. She's from an outside place. She, you know, I walk in and she hands me this big packet of papers, and we all kind of know what that means. Um, so <laughs> I didn't pass it to the intern. I didn't. Um, so I start sitting down. She's kind of talking and just laughing and stuff. And she told me, "Yeah, I was admitted to an outside place, and they told me I had." DVTs, the blood clots in my legs, and blood clots in my lungs. And some of you may know this story because she was ended up here. Um, and as I'm hearing this, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right, okay, this is probably not the case. But as I was looking through her stuff, and sure enough, she did. So, well, how are you feeling? So, well, I've been shortness of, having shortness of breath lately. I've been having to use, my sister-in-law has a uh, oxygen tank, so I've been having to use her oxygen. I said, oh, that's, that's great. So, we ended up sending her to labor unit. She got transferred here. Um, needs to say she did have bilateral blood clots and then a large, supposedly, saddle embolus. Um, and they treated her, and she did fine. She was discharged. She came back. And I saw it in, a, in clinic. I picked up her chart again. I walked in. Her husband stands up, and he says, he shook my hand, and he said, I want to thank you for saving my wife's life. I said, and I'm thinking to myself, I said, well, it's not a big deal. I said, we knew what to to do she needs to get to Shreveport and that's what I'm thinking I didn't tell her that and I just said you know you're welcome and all that stuff and then you know just thinking about that on yeah we have a lot of um, disease processes that we know how to manage um, in medicine but there are a lot of unknowns as well especially in OB there are a lot of unknowns that we don't know um, and also you know and in regards to ultrasound um, there are a lot of non-specific findings that really are basically probably won't cause any harm to the baby if there's nothing else going on and everything's fine. But to the mom, it can create a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry um, that, yes, there's something abnormal. We don't know what it is, what's going to happen. So um, my point is, is that, you know, even with these non-specific findings and we think yeah, everything is going to be fine, you know, there's a small percentage that can have, have uh, uh, abnormal pregnancies or abnormalities and it can be very stressful to the mom and even you know to the family and all that stuff so it's some things that we can um, this one of the, this topic here you know, a lot of the normal it's normal and a lot of babies turn out fine but there are a certain percentage that don't and that have some uh, significant comorbidities so I just want to take a we'll review kind of go through echogenic bowel the normal and also um, uh, just a differential diagnosis on possible causes of it, okay? So we'll talk about today, we'll first go through a couple cases that we've had. One was delivered uh, last year, and then we have one actually currently uh, still pregnant. Um, and we'll take a look at kind of the definition and diagnosis of echogenic bowel, some etiology, some causes of it. Um, and then we'll look at how do we manage these patients um, throughout their pregnancy and um, and on to delivery. And also look at you know some long-term outcomes if there's any on a isolated echogenic bowel, if there's any um, long-term um, bowel issues with, uh, with the babies as they grow older. So the first case is we're gonna look at, this is a lady that uh, delivered last year. Um, it's SC, she's a 35 year old, African American female, G5P4. Uh, she presented on her for initial OB visit on uh, May 20th. Um, and by her last menstrual, she was uh, 10 weeks and one day. No significant ma past medical history. Of note, her surgery, she's had an Easter back in 2009. So the one thing that I think was our big concern is she has an ectopic. Um, her OB history, uh, pretty non-significant. Uh, she's had four you know, vaginal babies full term, no complications. She's had a th three of them that have been relatively small. Um, but giving her size, she was very short stature, 
uh, low weight female. Her GYN history, not significant. She just takes some Tylenol, PRN. She's not allergic to anything. She does have a history of tobacco use, but she quit one month uh, prior to presenting to us and no alcohol or drug use. The only family history she's significant for is just uh, sickle cell trait in her family. So she ended up having a dating scan done that day and actually she was an IEP at 12 weeks and two days. Um, she underwent her growth and anatomy scan on the 25th of uh, June and uh, everything appeared normal. Baby, um, no abnormalities were noted and the growth was appropriate. She had a follow-up ultrasound. Uh, she was AMA, so we do level two ultrasounds, a little more detailed ultrasounds. And growth was, uh, growth was appropriate. However, they did note some, um, this questionable mild dilation of the fetal bowel. At that time, she was consented for, you know, non-invasive prenatal testing. Um, and then she ended up getting it on her next ultrasound or visit. So this is a picture here, I don't know if you can quite see, but uh, from the ultrasound images where the arrows are, this is this questionable, this dilated bowel here. Okay. So she went, uh, another growth scan was performed um, on the September 24th of 2014. And if you take a closer look of kind of her estimated fetal weight, compared to her previous ultrasound. Here, it's kind of uh, lagging a little bit. She is lagging in her uh, head circumference and her AC. Now, they still did note some of the, this dilated small bowel, but then this mildly echogenic bowel as well. She underwent uh, the non-invasive prenatal testing. It was low risk for uh, all trisomies, um, and it was a female uh, fetus. And here's another um, picture on that ultrasound on the 24th of September. I was still kind of this um, mildly dilated bowel and then also this echogenic bowel here. She then underwent another uh, follow-up ultrasound in October. Um, they didn't note anything about the echogenicity of the bowel, but they did find s still some dilated loops of bowel. She underwent her, um, her lab. She had some torch titers. Her CMV was negative and Toxo was negative. She underwent um, cystic fibrosis screening and she was negative for a test for 97 mutations um, in the uh, cystic fibrosis screening. And again, as you can see, She's starting to still lag in her um, in her HC, her head circumference, and her abdominal circumference. However, she was growing appropriately uh, on a weekly basis for her abdominal circumference. And this here is just a picture of the kind of the dilated bowel. I couldn't find any other uh, pictures of uh, the echogenicity of the bowel. Um, it may have resolved. She started twice weekly testing um, when she was considered kind of small for gestational age versus IUGR. Um, she had a repeat ultrasound on the 11th of um, uh, November and still kind of the same thing. However, she was still growing appropriately in her AC. All her twice weekly testing and her BPPs with Dopplers were all reassuring. Um, she underwent an induction um, at 39 weeks and she had a Little baby girl, five pounds, a little, um, five pounds and four, uh, 0.4 ounces. Apcores are eight and nine. Um, I tried to do a little study to see how the baby was doing, but I couldn't find the baby. Um, but from our notes, from when she followed up, you know, she said the baby was doing, doing great. No issues or anything. She did undergo a salpingectomy, um, I think in January of this year. Our second case is a little bit different. So the first one is normal, um, a normal outcome with this dilated loop bowel and also echogenic bowel. Second case is a little bit, a little different story. Uh, we'll kind of look at an, an abnormality. So Ms. CB is a 20 year old G1. Uh, she came in for initial uh, OB visit on April 22nd of this year. 
Um, she didn't know how far along she was. Um, no significant past medical surgery. She's G1, just has a history of chlamydia that was treated. Um, no meds, she's not allergic to anything, doesn't smoke or anything. Patient is a twin, um, and she has a, a cousin who has sickle cell disease, but no other significant medical issues. She missed her, her initial um, ultrasound appointment. She ended up getting rescheduled to uh, June 5th of this year. Growth, is, growth was appropriate, however, they did note this moderate uh, amount of echogenic, echogenic bowel. This is a, a, a picture here, as you can kind of see down here is the echogenic bowel there. And it's just another picture here for the spine up here, echogenic bowels down here. Another, just a different view here, the same thing, all this area here. So again, she underwent um, repeat ultrasound, was offered testing. Quad screen wasn't done for some reason. She may have missed an appointment, um, but she did undergo the non-invasive prenatal testing. Everything was fine, having a little baby girl. They did get a, a maternal serum AFP, which is within normal limits. However, she did, on her torch titers, her CMV came back. Um, both IgG and IgM were positive. And the avidity was a low avidity, and we'll kind of discuss that when we get to later on in the topic. Her toxo was negative, and she was negative for her CF mutations. She was offered an amnio for kind of a CMV culture, a PCR. Um, however, she was undecided at that time, but ended up coming back the next day for her amnio. So they did, on the amnio, they did find some CV was isolated, and the PCR was this uh, 2.3 million international units per mil. Um, she underwent a repeat ultrasound on the 28th of July, which was normal. Um, and then she had another ultrasound done on the 25th of uh, August recently. And it was noted that she's having this HC that's less than 2.3%. So she's having microcephaly. And also was noted these possible periventricular calcifications that were found. And that was all the abnormalities that were noted on our ultrasound from our pictures. So as you can see here, this, these questionable um, uh, periventricular calcifications in the ventricle here. So she has a, uh, a follow-up appointment in one month for a repeat ultrasound. So we're still in the process with her. She's met with NICU and ID and everything. And, um, you know, it's difficult to predict whether, you know, the baby is... Um, will be asymptomatic or have the disease when it's uh, a congenital infection when she is delivered. Um, but then, you know, obviously we perform the appropriate lab, you know, the screening with the uh, blood, urine, any brain imaging, eye exam, hearing testing. Um, and then, the, you know, NICU obviously will monitor the baby if it needs to be in the NICU if she becomes symptomatic. I think she has a repeat ultrasound, like I said, on the 22nd of this month. So we'll talk a little bit about kind of the uh, definition and how we uh, diagnose echogenic bowel. The prevalence, a lot of studies reported right around 1%. Uh, majority of them reported about 0.4 to 1.8%. Um, now that's in kind of a, it combines everything, whether the baby has any type of abnormalities, things like that. It's not just isolated. So it kind of encompasses all of it. Usually normal, normal, just isolated um, echogenic bowel and normal babies, no abnormalities or anything. They do just fine. It's normal and uh, one study showed up to 93% of cases of isolated echogenic bowel that it's, babies do fine. Um, so basically what it is, you have this increased brightness of the fetal bone on the, in the second trimester ultrasound. The second trimester ultrasound is important. Um, when they get further along, you know, they'll start having meconium in their, in their bowels as they get further along in the third trimester. Um, so it's hard to really differentiate if it's really a true echogenic bowel or if it's just meconium. So second trimester ultrasound is key. So they're looking at um, the echogenicity. It's 
greater than or equal to adjacent bone. Uh, now there are some studies that use the criteria of uh, comparing it to the liver, um, but a lot of the studies I've read, everything kind of compares everything to the, to the iliac, is the iliac bone or the iliac wing as its reference point. It can be diffuse or focal. It's, it's, um, it's uniform over a well-defined area. It does not shadow and it's located in the pelvis and in the abdomen. Um, this can be, you know, very subjective. You know, true echogenicity of fetal tissues is hard to really ascertain in utero. Um, you know, it just makes the correct assessment of, you know, fetal bone echogenicity very, very subjective, especially with, even with experienced sonographers. Um, so, but when you do have it and you do know it is, then you have to obviously evaluate it and offer the patient testing. Now there has been some studies shown with the transducer that we use for the ultrasound probe. And there's different frequencies that you can use and it's very important um, with this five megahertz versus this eight megahertz. There was a study done by Vinkoff and he wanted to look at how basically the ultrasound transducer frequency just affects the appearance of the fetal bowel. So what he did was he took 100 women with singleton pregnancies that were undergoing just routine second trimester um, examinations, not really second trimester, but the range was between you know, 16 and six up all the way into the uh, full term. Now majority, they did make note that majority of the patients, about 80 of the patients, 80% of the patients had their ultrasound done in the second trimester. And it was between 18 and 23 weeks. Um, what they did was they excluded any known fetal anomalies or abnormal serum screening, maternal infection, or even a history of um, cystic fibrosis. So basically it's all women that have just isolated echogenic bowel. And they, what they did was they took two pictures, one with the five megahertz and one with the eight megahertz transducer transducer. And two radiologists that were blinded to the patient, the transducer frequency, they were completely blinded. They looked at these two pictures and they rated the presence or absence of this echogenic bowel. Um, and like is the same uh, definition that we said earlier is that it was either greater than or equal to the adjacent bone. So on their results, they found that the, uh, with the eight megahertz transducer, the um, bowel was detected, echogenic bowel was detected by both observers in the, uh, in 31 percent. Now that's with both of them. Now that's compared to um, with a five megahertz transducer at three percent. So it's a pretty, I mean, it's a tenfold increase um, with using the eight megahertz transducer versus the five. And it was detected by at least one observer in 62 percent versus the 9% that was observed with the 5 megahertz. So basically what they concluded is that with echogenic bowel detected with a, you know, this high transducer frequency, it should not be considered pathologic and should, shouldn't prompt any further testing. It should be retested with this 5 megahertz uh, transducer. So now we'll take a, take a look at uh, some of the causes of echogenic bowel. All right, we'll kind of go through it, these individually and you know, going towards the end, uh, we won't really talk about GI obstruction because a lot of times you'll just see uh, these dilated loops. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, this echogenicity, but you know, it's rare in these, these cases. It's more, it's likely other um, pathologies that's involved with that than just the echogenic bowel. And also undetermined. A lot of times we can't find a reason for it and a lot of these babies just do they're just fine. So we'll kind of start with um, with bleeding. So blood in the amniotic cavity or any blood components which has crossed the amniotic membranes, you know, from placental bleeding. Now these babies will can ingest it with swallowing, and they can this this echogenic material in the fetal stomach that will eventually lead to the bowels. As you see a picture, you know, down here with the arrow. Here, there's just this echogenicity in the stomach um, that can relate to the blood. Um, and there's also, you can't really see here, and I can't even see on my screen, but there's supposedly a little 
particles or debris inside the, uh, inside the fluid there. There was a study that was done about uh, 20 years ago um, back in New York, and that was looking at the association between um, intra-amniotic bleeding and the echogenic bowel. So what he did was he followed 28 fetuses um, with visible intra-amniotic bleeding after um, an intrauterine blood transfusion for fetal anemia due to isoimmunization. What he did was he performed a, an ultrasound prior and obviously during the procedure when he was doing it, and so there was no signs of echogenic bowel whatsoever. And they did a follow-up ultrasound 12 hours um, after the procedure was done. And he found that 25% of them were found, it was found to have bowel echogenicity um, within those first 12 hours. Um, and then he, he goes on to say that, you know, we cannot really, um, even with this, you know, even if you don't know the cause, it, it is bleeding, you know, obviously he knew because he did the procedure, but when we get this, we can't assume that it's just bleeding going on. We do need to have uh, to further evaluate the bleeding. All right, and this is a uh, kind of a, a big topic because we're always screening for this, especially with any abnormalities that we have on ultrasounds, is aneuploidy. So basically what happens is that there's just this abnormal bowel function. You have a decreased motility, you have increased um, water absorption, um, in the bowel that gives us this echogenicity. Um, now, it's, there are rates up to 25% that's associated with aneuploidy. It ranges from about 3 to 25%, but it also, it, it kind of, um, it it's, takes into account kind of the differential or the way that we're, our diagnostic criteria, whether it's due to the, if we're comparing it to the bone or comparing it to the liver, there's just different grading criteria. And also the, the population that you're testing if their aneuploidy risk is a little higher than um, to others. So it can be as high as up to 25%. The most common is Down syndrome. Um, and that increases uh, with obviously other sonographic markers or structural abnormalities. Um, a study done by Al Quatley at all in 2001, um, they were looking at the clinical significance of fetal echogenic bowel. Um, and what he looked at, you know, was this, you know, if there is, one, he looked at kind of the incidence of kind of cystic fibrosis, aneuploidy, um, and infection with either toxoplasmosis or CMV. And specifically for aneuploidy, he had a total of, well, total with everything was a whole uh, 139 fetuses. Um, five fetuses, there was some sort of trisomy detected. Now out of those five, 80% were trisomy 21. The other one was trisomy 18. Um, and a similar study that was a larger study that was done in France uh, by Simon Bowie in 2003, they had a total, it's kind of the similar, the similar pictures, picture as the, the previous, um, we had a total of 682 cases, and out of those cases, you had 24 that were some chromosome anomaly or abnormality, and 17 or 71 percent were uh, diagnosed with uh, Down syndrome. So in cystic fibrosis, we'll kind of talk a little bit about that, and then also just kind of the inheritance of it, and, um, and then move on. It, we didn't find too many uh, too many studies with cystic fibrosis, just kind of the prevalence of it with the echogenic bowel. Basically what you're having is an ab abnormality in the pancreatic enzyme secretion, so the meconium becomes more viscous. Um, so we do know that's an autosomal recessive. The incidence of it is one in 3,300. Now the carrier frequency basically is anyone that's coming in for kind of a preconceptual counseling and everyone has a carrier frequency with a kind of quoted increase, it was one in 25. All right, so if you, if you screen the patient um, without um, just screening them, their risk, and they're negative, their risk becomes 1 in 241. <coughs> now, if couples, if you're just, basically the carrier frequency for a couple will be this 1 in 2500 without screening, 
But if you screen both and both the, the, the couple screens negative, that risk drops to this one in 232, a little more than 232,000. So it's very, very low. However, if you do have a screen that is um, the partner or the patient screen is positive, but you have a negative screen, that risk is about one in 964. And if obviously if they both screen positive, then you have the one in four risk since it's autosomal recessive. Um, now screening is not, this just goes to show that screening is not 100%. So there is still a small risk. And even with the testing with the, uh, the testing that we do that tests us for the 97 mutations, it always makes a point that says screening is not 100%. So there's still a very, 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 very small risk of the baby having um, possibly cystic fibrosis. Uh, studies that I found that we looked at kind of the, the prevalence with the echogenic bowel was around 3 to 7.6% with cystic fibrosis. So we'll take a look at, so likely, you know, congenital infection is probably the least common cause of echogenic bowel, but we'll take a look at the most common, which is, uh, which is CMV. I'll talk quickly about kind of the epidemiology and the and diagnosis of uh, congenital uh, or CMV. So it is a DNA virus of the, the herpes family. So it does uh, remain latent in host cells after the in initial infection. A likely recurrent infection is usually caused by reactivation rather than um, uh, rather than reinfection. So obviously we know close, close personal contact is required for infection. Now there's two ways that you can transmit it, horizontal transmission or vertical. Horizontal, it could be for transfusion of infected blood. Now we see a lot of that when we're ordering blood to do CMV negative blood. Um, and we should do that in our pregnant patients. Um, transplantation or of an infected organ, sexual contact, um, even contact with just contaminated saliva or urine. Now with vertical transmission, obviously, so with you think about during pregnancy is you have the transplacental infection. Um, exposure to any type of uh, secretions during, during delivery or even in, in breastfeeding. So to diagnose it, obviously you do uh, viral culture, you can do PCR and also um, serologic methods. Um, IgM titers, they usually decline over a period of 30 to 60 days. However, they can remain elevated for up to a year. And with IgG, to see kind of if it's consistent with a recent infection, you want to see a uh, fourfold increase over the over a couple weeks. And like I talked about earlier, in the avidity of the IgG antibody, so you can have low, low moderate, or, or high. And a low moderate, we know, and it's and you also have positive IgM, then we know that there's a, a recent infection, likely within the last four months. If they have a high avidity IgG, likely it's just a recurrent infection. So how does CMV actually cause the echogenic bowel? And um, so basically they can have direct damage to the fetal intestines or it's indirect by if they maybe has ascites, anemia, or any type of uh, growth restriction. And this was the same study that was done by Simon Bowie in 2003 where they looked at the um, 682 babies with echogenic bowel, about 2.8 percent of the t of, of those babies had was had a viral infection, and about 80 percent of those babies were had CMV. Now, five to 15 percent of those infants who develop this congenital CMV um, are symptomatic at birth, um, it, and it also depends on the severity. Um, obviously, the severely affected, they do, uh, they don't make it, and about 30 percent. However, 80 percent of the survivors, they can have, it just depends on their, uh, their severity of infection at delivery and um, the neonatal period that they have major morbidity. Some of the things that they can have is um, hepatosphingal megaly, intracranial calcifications, jaundice, growth restriction, microcephaly, coronary retinitis, hearing loss thrombocytopenia, uh, hepatitis, and a, a couple others as well. But, you know, a lot of the, you know, if babies are asymptomatic, um, you know, they, they do well, but 10, 10 to 15 percent of those still may develop hearing loss, retinitis, or any type of 
dental defects by two years of life. So you also take a look at when you get exogenic bowel, you need to worry about, you know, how the baby is growing. Is it baby growth restricted? So there is the, the theory behind that is there's just this redistribution of blood flow to the vital organs that results in kind of bowel ischemia um, and hypoperfusion. So um, this doctor here, Goetzinger, in 2011, they wanted to look at kind of the risk of IUGR and IUF uh, intrauterine fetal demise with findings of echogenic bowel. So they took a total of this great number, almost 50,000 with non-echogenic versus echogenic bowel. Um, and they compared to see basically their risk of IUGR and IUFD if it's increased with echogenic bowel. Um, and they found that with IUGR babies that there's this adjusted odds ratio and what they adjusted for was African-American race preeclampsia, pregestational diabetes, um, and also uh, tobacco use as well. So as you can see with IGR, there's a adjusted odds ratio of 2.1 with the, this uh, statistical significance here, and the IUFD, same thing, this is 9.6 and with the statistical significance. And then that was the total. Now they wanted to look at just isolated echogenic bowel uh, versus non-echogenic. Um, so obviously it wasn't as many cases of the total echogenic with if there's anything else going on with them as well. But just looking at isolated, the same type of picture here. Uh, they adjusted for the same thing. They, you know, obviously they took out uh, CMV anomalies, infections, um, any, uh, any other ab abnormalities that could be the cause of it, uh, cystic fibrosis. So, and they found kind of the same picture. It was this 2.1 for IGR and this IUFD was a 7.4. Both were uh, statistically significant. Now, there is a, a wide confidence, inter confidence interval, but, you know, if you're only looking at, you probably need a larger study population uh, to be able to kind of tighten that confidence interval up. But it, it does go to show that, yes, they are at increased risk with, you know, with IGR and, and IUFD. So the um, Al Kuatli actually did another study. It was actually the same year as the one that we presented earlier. Who they wanted to look at just uh, the, what are the factors that are associated with fetal demise with um, babies with fetal echogenic bowel. Um, so they wanted to look at the risk factors. Okay. So what this was was a retrospective case uh, case control that compared fetuses with echogenic bowel and fetal demise. Um, with echogenic bowel who were live born. Um, so what they looked at was IGR, oligohydramnios, this maternal serum, alpha fetal protein, and the beta HCG levels. Now we did, I didn't include the beta HCG levels because there was uh, no really um, statistical significance with the HCG level. Um, so what they looked at was a whole a, a total of 156 total fetuses, nine with fetal demise, and they had 147 that were live born. The IUFD incidence was 5.8. IEGR was 22% uh, versus the 0.7 that were live born. And the oligo was the 44% versus 2%. And also um, a pretty significant um, increase in the, they have elevated MS AFP um, in the fetal demise babies versus the live born at 7.7 percent. So basically what they came to the conclusion is that most fetuses with echogenic bowel and any and absent any major anomalies um, in the second trimester are not you really not affected by that aren't affected by aneuploidy cystic fibrosis or congenital infection will be live born. However, when you do have the presence of IUGR, oligodramnios, or this elevated MSAFP, you know, there, are, there is a significant risk of fetal demise in these babies. So how do we manage these patients from an obstetric standpoint? Um, it can be very challenging because 
you know, you're trying to reassure the patient, but also you're trying to diagnose to see if there's anything else going on. Um, and it can be very, like I said before, cause the um, mom to have a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of questions that likely can't be answered at the time. Um, it's hard to give a definitive diagnosis, a definitive plan, and a lot of patients that we have in, um, in obstetrics. So obviously you'll do a detailed fetal anatomy ultrasound, like a level two ultrasound, um, and you'll do repeat ultrasounds. You wanna counsel the patient about if there's any potential fetal disorders and, and offer the patient testing. You wanna uh, screen them for cystic fibrosis, um, any aneuploidy testing with this, the non-invasive prenatal testing. Um, and even a torch panel to look at kind of CMV and toxo. Um, then if any of the serologic evidence of infection, you um, offer them an um to look if there's any type of uh, congenital uh, or transmission to the baby. If baby's IEGR, you know, we do close surveillance. We start twice weekly testing, um, usually at the time of diagnosis, and then we repeat the growth scan every two to four weeks. And also if there is, you can be pretty certain if, you know, you find no sort of abnormality going on, no aneuploidy, cystic fibrosis, um, no signs of infection, growth restriction, you can be, you can give mom some reassurance that likely everything's okay, it's not 100%, but we have a pretty good chance that everything is gonna be just fine. This was, so kind of the long-term management or long-term outcomes of these babies that have um, echogenic bowel. This was a study done by Patel. Um, and they were looking at if any long-term bowel symptoms um, in babies that were born with just an isolated echogenic bowel. So this was a retrospective study back from you know, 1994 to 2000. And what they did was they obtain the information about the children um, from diagnosis just relating to their bowel symptoms and also from a questionnaire that was sent to their general practitioner. They found a, whole, a total of 109 cases, 103 questionnaires were sent out. Some were either lost to follow up or they didn't send it back and things like that. And they looked at, so 81% of the 103, quares, 103 questionnaires sent out, they responded. Um, 74 or 89% had no bowel symptoms. Now nine of them, which was 11%, they either reported constipation, GERD, chronic abdominal pain, um, or colic. Now that's not to say that there's something else going on. Likely it's not from the, the echogenic bowel, but they did report that. So they found that there's no um, serious long-term bowel pathology associated with any type of isolated uh, echogenic bowel. That's it. Questions, comments, concerns? Yes, sir. I did not hear you right. In your second case, uh, that's about 36 weeks gestation now, uh, you stated that you evaluated the new one here. To me, that is the entry for CMV infection, so we would have to be with the I was suggesting that Dr. Mentory and all, because he's already going on. Thank you. Are you covering concept? Yeah. I was worried about your concern about your fetal demise. That seemed very hard. More than two fold. Of course, SGA was a common denominator. So then they look at the placenta, what was causing the demise, you know? They did, they did specifically look at the placenta in that study to uh, evaluate it. But yeah, it, it was kind of strange. I think it may be in relation just to the study population. It's not a large study population. Um, so it felt like it was pretty significant. Causes the echogenicity with the CMV or torch infections? I mean, you kind of know that they're swallowing blood, CF. You know, the motility is not correct, there's debris in the bowel. just have a redistribution of the blood. What they see is there's actually either a direct, um, a direct effect to the bowel, or if there's any other associated symptoms, if those babies has ascites or um, growth restriction, 
um, that could cause it as well. So it's kind of a direct or an indirect cause. 